Chapter 20 Snorri, wait! hissed Felix, dogging the steps of the slayer as he pushed through the brambles. You can't go, remember? You must recover your memory first. Aye, slayer, said Cat, following on his other side. You won't be allowed into Grimnir's hall. Snorri knows, said Snorri. He will take care of that just as soon as he sorts out these beastmen. But the beastmen will sort you out, said Felix, exasperated. You're gonna meet your doom there. Snorri! And it will be too soon, said Cat. But these are beastmen, said Snorri, breaking through the last of the bushes. Felix looked around to see if any beastmen had noticed them. They were all looking towards Godric and Rodi. He grabbed Snorri's arm and Cat caught the wrist of his hammer hand. Snorri, please, said Felix. Snorri shrugged off Felix as if he were a fly, and then gently pried Cat's hand away, all without breaking stride. You don't have to hold Snorri back, said Snorri. There are plenty of beastmen for everyone. Felix and Cat made another grab at him, but just then Snorri swept his hammer up over his head and charged forwards, bellowing a casalid war cry. Felix groaned, all his dreams of escaping Godric's doom and starting a new life vanishing in an instant. The cheese-brained old idiot had ruined everything. He turned to Cat. I... I'm sorry. I have to protect him. I promised. Cat shrugged and gave him a sad half-smile, as she settled her own bow over the shoulder and drew her axes. And I promised to fight at your side. He wanted to tell her no, to send her back to the stairs, but there was no time for argument. If this suicide was gonna mean anything, he had to help the slayers reach the shaman. As one, he and Cat sprinted after Snorri into the fight, roaring and screaming and slashing at the backs of the blue-painted beastmen which surrounded Rodi and Godric. Felix was so full of rage that he cut down two beastmen in one blow. He just imagined that they were Snorri. As the beast fell, Felix saw Godric look up from slaying a beast initiate to see Snorri fighting beside him. Godric snarled and looked around. He found Felix and glared at him with one angry eye. Felix shrunk from his displeasure. He woke up, he said, ducking a huge club. I couldn't. Godric cursed and gutted another beastman with an unnecessary vicious twist of the axe. Beside him, Snorri dashed out the brains of another, while Rodi headbutted a third between the legs. All at once, they were through the initiates and stumbling into the middle of the stone circle. Gotrek, Rodi, and Snorri turned to face the blue-painted guardians, who had been fighting so hard to stop them from entering it. But the beastmen skidded to a stop at a line of standing stones, staring at a huge glowing herdstone in abject fear, and would come no further. Ha! barked Gotrek. To the shaman! The runes on the slayer's axe flared white hot as he turned, and Felix didn't wonder why. Entering the circle of men here was like stepping into an arcane furnace. Chaos energy radiated from the blazing blue veins of the hoodstone in great pulsing waves, making the skin itch as if he were being eaten away by ants and filling his mind with chittering bird-like voices. Gatrek, Rodi, and Snorri ran directly for Urslak, and Felix and Cat followed. There was no one to stop them. The crooked horned shaman continued his invocation, entirely unaware of their presence. The rest of the initiates remained transfixed as well, and the guardians remained at the edge of the circle, fearing to come inside. Felix's heart pounded in unexpected hope. They were gonna make it. But then, into the circle charged Gargoroth the God touched, the hulking black furred, blue eyed war leader, with five blue painted, heavily armored gores at his back. Gargoroth roared a challenge at the slayers, his hate filled eyes glowing with the same fire that emanated from the herdstone, as he raised his vulture headed axe above his head. Felix heard the weapon scream, the high, harsh shriek of a bird of prey. He shivered as he recalled poor Ortwin's last words. The axe ate what it killed. 
he wasn't sure what that meant, but he hoped he would never find out. The Slayers answered the challenge with roars of their own, and with a deafening crunch of steel and bone, the two sides slammed together. Felix and Kat swung at a brass-armored elk man as Snorri, Godric and Rodi piled into the others. The elk man smashed aside Felix's puny attacks with a crusty black iron mace that likely weighed more than Kat. Felix staggered back, his hands stinging from the impact. Kat leapt aside, one of the axes snapped in half, and before they could recover the elk man was on them again, sending them diving away. Felix's palms turned slick with fear. The elk man was stronger and more skilled than any other beastman Felix had ever faced, an actual warrior rather than just an animal. The slayers were having the same difficulty. Gotrek blocked Gargoroth's strike but was driven back several feet by the strength of the blow, the vulture-headed weapon screaming in his face. Snorri was bleeding from a deep cut on his arm and was backing away from two bellowing beasts. Rodi's face was a mask of blood as he was fighting two more. Red sprayed from his braided beard with every swing of the axe. Felix, look out! Cat shoved Felix as he staggered aside, just as the elkman's club whistled past his cheekbone. So close it made him blink. He returned his attention to the fight, aiming a cut at the beastman's eyes as Cat swiped at the ankles. The gore jumped back before this coordinated attack, and they pressed forwards. On the other side of the fight, Gotrek and Gargaroth's axes met blade to blade, and Gotrek's axe was caught in the vulture-headed weapon's beak notch. Gargaroth tried to twist Gotrek's axe out of his hands, but the slayer reversed the twist, his muscles bulging, and Gargaroth's axe spun past Snorri's head and landed on the ground. The Slayer aimed a cut at a defenseless Gargoroth, but when the big beastman leapt aside, Godric charged past him, straight at a shaman. Felix stole glances from his own fight as Gargoroth chased after the Slayer. Godric swiped behind him with the axe, wringing it off the war leader's leg armor, but the beast caught him by the neck and shoulder and lifted him above his head. Godric! cried Felix, and then to Cat, we have to help him. He and Cat jumped back from the Elkman and ran to Gotrek's aid, but before they could take three steps, they saw the Slayer chop down wildly at Gargoroth's head. The Runax sheared off one of the horns and part of the ram-like snout. The beast howled in agony and flung the Slayer away as hard as he could, right at a herdstone. No! Felix and Cat chopped at Gargoroth as Gotrek sailed over the chanting shaman's head to crash down at the base of the herdstone. Cat's axe glanced off the warleader's steel and brass breastplate, not even scratching it. Karagul bit into the armor but did not touch flesh. The massive gore flattened them both with a careless backhand, and then ran to snatch up his fallen axe. Felix struggled up, trying to block Gargoroth's way. But the Elkman was on him again, and he had to fall back, the mace shivering his blade and turning his arms to jelly. Behind him, Kat sat up, shaking her head wizzily. Gargoroth roared at her, axe in hand, charging towards Godric and the stone as Felix parried another brutal blow from the Elkman. Godric stood to meet the war leader, beckoning with his offhand and swinging his arm back in preparation for a powerful slash. As he did, the runax grazed the herdstone, the merest touch. But there was a sudden sparking crack, and a flash of pure white energy, and the ground slipped sideways beneath Felix's feet. Felix caught himself before he fell, and blinked his eyes to clear the afterimages that danced before them. He looked around, his head throbbing. Godric was doubled up, his right arm cradled against his chest, while his axe lay smoking at his feet. Everyone else, man, dwarf and beastman, stood frozen, looking up at the herdstone. It was steaming and hissing, and little crumbling shards were flaking from it and raining down on the ground, while the blue quartz veins that ran through it flickered and flashed like a torch in a windstorm. The first one to recover his composure was the beast shaman Urslak, who backed away and pointed a clawed finger at Gotrek, shrieking for his blood. The ring of initiates heeded the call, 
casting down their fetishes and drawing crude weapons as they surged forwards, braying in rage. Gargaroff and his lieutenants added their voices to the howl and charged for the slayer, but Rodi and Snorri had recovered as well and leapt to stop them. You unfaithful beasts, roared Rodi. You are my doom. And Snorri's, called Snorri. Felix and Kat joined the slayers, slashing at Gargaroff and the elkman and trying to keep them from Godric until he recovered. But the war leader was too strong. He knocked Felix aside, and he and the elkman bounded over Kat towards the stunned slayer, while Snorri and Rodi engaged the others. Beware the leader, Godric, called Felix from the ground. But Godric paid Gargaroff and the followers no attention. Instead, as he shook off his shock, he looked from the axe to the herdstone and back again, a cunning glint kindling in his single eye. Felix knew that look of old, and it never boded well for anyone in the vicinity. Gartrek, that's a very bad idea, he shouted, picking himself up. Gartrek snatched up his axe and dodged Gargaroth's charge, laughing darkly. No, manling, he laughed. It is a very good idea. Gargaroth and the Elkman slashed down at the slayer with their weapons. Gartrek knocked both attacks aside with a whistling backhand, and then swung upwards, decapitating the Elkman's mace and tearing through its armor and flesh like a plow through earth. As the beast toppled to the ground in an explosion of blood, Gartrek aimed another cut at Gargaroth. The beastman desperately threw himself back to avoid the strike, and it clashed with his breastplate, raising sparks and knocking him flat on his back. Gartrek did not follow up. Instead, he turned to the herdstone again and swung his axe at it with all his might. For a brief second, Felix thought that the world had ended. The thundercrack flash of the strike blinded and deafened him, and he lost all sense of up or down. He opened his eyes to find himself sprawled on the ground, along with all his friends and foes. The beasts were everywhere, writhing and clutching their horned heads. The shaman was shrieking as if he'd been stabbed in the eye. Cat was curled up in a bowl. Godric lay on his back, spread-eagled, his eyebrows and the ends of his beard and crest smoking ten feet away from the stone. The axe lay beside him, its head glowing as if just now it had left the forge. The herdstone was shaking itself to pieces. Large chunks were breaking off and crumbling to dust as they fell, and the quartz veins were starred with fissures, like thick glass under pressure. Felix felt an unnatural wind blowing, not from the stone, but towards it, and he saw that the dust and the pebbles that were falling from the stone were being sucked into the cracks in the quartz. Godric groaned and sat up, as stiff and slow as an old man. He took up his axe and used it to lever himself to his feet. One more ought to do it, he grunted. Wait, Godric, shouted Felix over the wind and the rising hum of the stone. You'll kill us. Then you'd better run, manling, said Godric, and limped towards the stone as if his legs were made of lead. Felix cursed as he forced himself to his feet, nor was he the only one less than happy with Godric's course of action. Gargaroff and the remaining lieutenants were rising and staggering towards him, and Urslak, the shaman, was raising his arms and snarling out a vile incantation as the claw clutch blue orb at the top of his staff began to glow and pulse. Felix noted with horror that all the bird claw fetishes that dangled from his robes were clutching and unclutching their talons in time to the chant. Hurry, said Felix, lifting Cat to her feet and urging her forwards. Run! Is he really going to? Cat asked, looking back. Without a doubt, said Felix. He and Cat turned and ran as Rodi and Snorri lurched up to intercept Gargaroth and his warriors, and Urslak stalked towards Godric, who was still limping doggedly towards the stone. The initiate beastmen had recovered now, and they were charging forwards again too. Felix and Cat lashed at them as they came, but the gores hardly paid them any notice. All their attention was focused on Godric and the stone. A crazy hope flared in Felix's heart as the way cleared before them. 
The stair to the tunnel was only a few paces beyond the stone circle. If they were lucky, and the rest of the beastmen ignored them as well, they might just survive this mad folly after all. Felix looked back. Beyond Rodi and Snorri's battle with the beastmen, Urslag swung his staff at Gotrek, the blue orb glowing like an azure sun. Gotrek hacked the staff in two, and then gutted the shaman and kicked him back before the claw-held orb had stopped bouncing across the rocky ground. The slayer then spat on the dying shaman, and then turned back to the herdstone, raising his axe. Faster, said Felix, and sprinted with Cat for the ring of monoliths. They weren't fast enough, though. With another deafening crack, he and Cat were knocked flat again by a jolt stronger than all the others. It felt as if a giant had pushed him in the back with an enormous shovel, knocking the wind out of him and pushing him back to the brink of unconsciousness. He thought about trying to move, but it seemed too much effort. Easier to just lie there. And then Cat whimpered beside him. The thought of her galvanized him. He had to get her to safety. As Felix fought to regain his senses, gasping and groaning and blinking the glare out of his eyes, he became aware of a thunderous roaring behind him, and of a hard wind battering his face. He raised himself on shaking arms and looked back, and then froze at what he saw. The towering herdstone was rising from the ground and expanding. The jagged lines that had been the seams of quartz now widened into gaps between huge floating shards of granite that moved outwards from the core of the stone. And through these gaps shone a terrible blue light that bathed the inside of the stone circle in a harsh sapphire glow. The impossible wind flew towards the widening cracks from all directions, as if they were chimney flues sucking smoke from the fireplace. Felix's hair streamed towards it. Leaves and branches whirled towards it. The wind tore at the floating granite shards of the herdstone too, crumbling their edges and sucking in the pebbles, so they shrank even as the gaps between them grew even wider. Felix squinted into the light that streamed from the expanding cracks, and the sickening dread swallowed all their fears as he saw its source. Hanging within the core of the fragmenting herdstone was a hole in the world, a gash in reality that looked into some other place. Blue swirls of every shade wove a hypnotizing dance inside the rift. Blue swirls that looked at him with fierce intelligence, and begged him to join them in the search for ultimate knowledge. Cat whimpered again beside him. It's... it's beautiful. Felix turned and clapped a hand over her eyes. Don't look, he cried. It will take your mind. He fought to his feet, the unnatural wind pulling at him and then dragged her up too. Come on, turn away from it, run! And yet, even as he followed her, pushing hard against the rising wind, Felix found it impossible not to look back. The beastmen were running from the stone, the initiates screaming in fear as the sucking wind dragged them back. Gargoroth and the surviving lieutenants trampling them and hurling them aside in their eagerness to get away. Chasing them came Gotrek, Rodi, and Snorri, all of them roaring insults over the shrieking gale. Come back, you cowards, called Gotrek. Are you afraid of a little wind? bellowed Rodi. Snorri has seen squirrels with more courage, shouted Snorri. Felix could feel the wind trying to lift him off the ground as he leaned against it, and it was getting worse. It was gonna suck him into the rift. Only two more yards to the men here's, but it might as well have been two miles. He put Cat in front of him to shield her and they pressed on, fighting for every inch. More debris whipped past them, flying towards the vortex. One of the beasts they had killed as they fought their way into the circle rolled by, flopping loosely over and over. Finally they reached the ring of monoliths, and Felix pushed Cat into the shadow of one, where the wind was less, and then struggled to pull himself behind it as well. Cat caught his arms and hauled with all her might. With a final grunt of effort, he stumbled behind a stone and collapsed against it, breathing heavily. The shadow of their stone shelter was as sharp as a knife in the harsh light of the vortex, and stretched away with the shadows of the other stones down the sloping sides of the hill to the valley below. 
nothing could be seen within the shadows, but a light that blazed from between the stones illuminated a roiling sea of beastmen backing away from Tarnhol's crown with naked terror showing in their glittering black eyes. Felix couldn't blame them. If he could have run, he would have been over the hills and gone long ago. Are we safe even here? asked Cat. Felix shrugged weakly. I don't know, but I can go no further. A movement in the corner of his eye made him turn up his head. Gargaroff and his lieutenants had escaped the circle and were straining to reach the slope down into the valley as the gale tore at their armor and their fur. Felix put his head around the corner of the standing stone, looking into the circle for Godric, Rodi, and Snorri. The three slayers were plowing on, slowly but steadily, against the wind, cursing all the while. Behind them, the initiate beastmen were not doing as well. Felix saw one fall backwards and roll head over heels towards the howling stone. Another was lifted bodily and spun away through the air to be sucked into the fissures between the shards, breaking up into its component parts as it went. The wind was too loud to hear the screams. And then Felix saw a lone figure rising before the stone. It was Urslak. It seemed impossible for him to be alive, after the evisceration Godric had given him. It seemed even more impossible that he was able to stand steady so close to the stone and the vacuum of the vortex. And yet, he did. Though buffeted cruelly by the wind, he straightened his hunched form and spread his arms wide, calling out some incantation that was lost in the roaring rush of the air. His claw-festooned robe flapped and fluttered around him like a living thing, and his intestines, which had spilled through the cut made by Gotrek's axe, streamed out in front of him, drawn towards the glowing void and waving like some grisly banner. Felix wasn't sure if the old shaman was trying to repair the damage that Godric had done, or was simply praying to his god. Whatever the case, neither the wind nor the light diminished. In fact, both grew stronger, rising to an unbearable intensity as the granite shards began to crumble away to mere slivers. The slayers were on their hands and knees now, crawling with their heads down away from the herdstone. Godric was in the lead, only two strides away from Felix but Felix was afraid they would not make it. Come on, Gotrek, shouted Felix. But he doubted the Slayer could hear him. He couldn't even hear himself. More of the initiate beastmen fell back and flew away, vanishing into the vortex in flashes of blue-white. Felix felt the massive monolith he leaned against shift under his shoulder as the wind pulled at it. By Sigmar, the rift was gonna suck in the entire world. It would swallow everything. Finally, after a handful of lip-chewing seconds, as the wind shrieked louder and the light grew still brighter, Godric and Rodi dragged themselves behind the monolith just to the left of the one Felix and Cat hid behind. Only Snorri stayed in the light. He looked back over his shoulder and shook his hammer at a vortex, shouting something Felix couldn't hear. But then big hands reached out of the shadow and jerked him back, and he vanished into the blackness behind the stone. Felix was sure it wouldn't matter. They would all be pulled into the glittering void. All their hopes and dreams for the future ended here in a blinding flash of blue. He looked back towards the stone, shielding his eyes against the glare, and saw Urslak still standing there, a black silhouette against the bright blue, his arms wide, chanting ceaselessly as the wind tore at him. The shaman grew thinner as Felix was watching. The light was eating him. He was disintegrating, his flapping intestines and his flesh tearing away in chunks and vanishing into the swirling core, leaving at last nothing but a skeleton, and then that went too, flaking away like ash until there was nothing left. Felix pulled back behind the monolith, unable to look anywhere as the light blazed from blue to white and the wind rose to an apocalyptic shriek. He wrapped Kat in his arms and hugged her tightly, certain that these were their last moments together, and content, or nearly content, that his life should end this way. Faces flashed before him like wreckage in the wind. Godric, Snorri, they were here. At least he was with them at the end. But there was no Max, no Malachi, no, no Ulrika. He cursed himself for thinking about her. 
Cat was here. Cat who loved him and whom he loved. He should be content. He should be ready. A clap like thunder shook the ground and made him slap his hands to his ears. It felt as if his head was going to implode. Cat did the same, screaming inaudibly. And then, utter silence, utter blackness, utter stillness. He lay in at a moment, stunned into motionlessness. Had a thunderclap broken his eardrums? Had it killed him? Was this some empty afterlife? He tried to feel his arms and legs, but he wasn't sure he had them anymore. Is this death then? he whispered, looking around at the impenetrable darkness. Is this the endless sleep of eternity? What did you say? said a voice from nearby. Snorri can't hear a thing. Felix frowned. It was pretty certain that the endless sleep of eternity wouldn't have Snorri Nosebiter in it. And then Cat shifted against him, and he realized he was still alive. After another moment of quiet contemplation, he finally found the energy to sit up. The blackness, which had seemed absolute after so much light, was now penetrable, showing stars above and far-off torches and fires down in the valley, and the faint glow of the moons that showed Felix the line of Cat's cheekbones and the white streak in her hair. What happened? she asked. I don't know, said Felix. To their left, Godrek, Rodi and Snorri were grunting to their feet. Felix and Cat did the same groaning and wheezing dizzily. Felix felt like he was on a ship in a heavy sea. The ground wouldn't stay still under his feet. After a moment with his head down, he straightened and followed the dwarves as they stepped out from behind the monolith and looked at the circle. The vortex was gone, and so was the herdstone. No trace of it whatsoever remained. It had been sucked into the rift. What happened to it? Felix asked. I thought it was gonna swallow all of us. Things of chaos are unstable, Manling, said Gotrek. It swallowed itself. Then the Empire is safe, said Felix with a relieved sigh. The shaman is dead. The herdstone is gone. The people of the Drakwald will not become monsters. By Tal and Raya, look at the men here's, breathed Cat, interrupting him. Felix and the others turned to look at the ring of monoliths. They were all leaning in towards the center of the circle, like fingers closing, or like old crones whispering to one another. He shivered. The vortex had nearly succeeded in pulling the massive slabs of stone from the ground, and if they had gone, Felix and the others would have been quick to follow. Never mind the stones, said Rodi. Look at the bodies. Felix looked at where the slayer pointed. On the ground, close to the center of the circle, the bodies of a few beastmen remained, fallen where they had dropped when the vortex had closed. There was nothing left of them but skeletons, but the skeletons were strange. They didn't gleam white in the light of the two moons. They gleamed yellow, golden yellow. Gold by Grungni, cried Rodi, stepping forwards, his eyes gleaming with dwarfish lust. And of the purest kind too, by the look of it. Snorri sees sapphires too, said Snorri, stepping closer and pointing to a golden skull. Felix stared at the thing, amazed. The horns and the claws and the hooves of the skeleton were indeed deep, star-crossed sapphire, polished as if by a master jeweler. Godrek put his arms out and held Snorri and Rodi back. You want nothing to do with that gold, nor that sapphire, he said. But why not, said Rodi, his eyes glazed with desire. It will solve everything. I can go back. I can pay the debt. I can... Gotrek slapped him hard across the cheek. Rodi snarled and doubled his fists. Gotrek only glared at him, his single eye as cold as ice. It has already made you forget your oath, he said, and you haven't even touched it. Can you not see it for what it is? Rodi remained with his fists up for a long moment, and then at last he sighed and lowered his hands. 
You are right, Gurnison. Gold born of such an abomination could only bring misery. Forgive me. Snorri still thinks it's pretty, said Snorri. Gotra grunted and turned to Kath. It is time to blow your horn, little one, he said, and then looked to Felix and Snorri, his brow lowering. And it is time for you. He was interrupted by the sound of rally horns blaring from the north. Everyone turned. The thunder of guns and cannons echoed off the stones around them, and the roar of angry beastmen filled the valley. The armies, said Cat, they're attacking.